after Atlanta, and this is equivalent to the, uh, the truncated lattice and distance. So what's happening here is uh, we have coloration at cost, uh, but outside of some radius, um, we can think about uh, sort of the, the, the transport here as transporting anything uh, within the radius and teleporting anything without the radius, uh, outside of the radius. Um, and so we can the ground is the minimum between the uh, radius and the distance function, and you get this truncated washes to distance, and this is uh, equivalent the value that you get out is equivalent to the truncated washes to distance. Um, so this is a very interesting, right? Like because you get this minimum, um, then this is this is in a way very easy to compute because we can always just, for instance, take the, the distance and then uh, truncate. However, there's no easy way to do this. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess this hasn't been considered very much in uh, other multi-scale uh, methods. And so one of the challenges we found in the PPNG is that the maximum scale is quite hard to compute. Um, but uh, here, this suggests that if we truncate it to smaller maximum scales, then we can get the unbalanced maximum distance without computing the maximum scale. Um, so the maximum scale controls sort of the threshold for the maximum geodesic distance methods, right? So you only go up to scale four, say, right here, and we'll only consider points uh, within this sort of this bump three, right? um, and in fact within sixteen steps, right, two two different steps. Um, so uh, this bounds sort of the maximum scale and bounds the uh, the radius that we're considering. So then we get the unbalanced with the distances, or if you have a smaller k, uh, which is the maximum scale. And so here we're looking at the threshold or the geodesic distance on a, on a circle um, versus the uh, maximum scale parameter in the, uh, the P and the And so we can see here that as the, uh, these are clearly very related. Right? So maximum scale here, um, if you have a very small maximum scale, then you're sort of looking like this flat function, but as it grows larger and larger, uh, you're getting more and more uh, accurate distance over a longer range. And so we can prove that at scale zero, you get the coloration distance, and at scale infinity, you get, or at least large enough, you get uh, very close to the uh, first nervous distance, uh, this alpha parameter. Uh, but we don't really know, or at least our theory hasn't extended things in between as well. Um, so we're still working in there. Um, so just in summary, uh, the Christian EMD embeds the distributions uh, where the L1 norm uh, between these vectors is equivalent to the EMD between distributions over this current manifold. Um, but by using the geodesic ground distance, we skirt around the problem of the high dimensional data. So we scale instead with the dimensional, dimensionality of the manifold uh, instead of the EMD dimension. And so by operating with a sparse graph, <coughs> uh, constructed from data, we avoid computing and optimizing over the pairwise distance graph. And so for, for the nearest neighbors, we can avoid detecting all the pairwise because we have this geometry between vectors. So we can use uh, some fast search method like uh, some local sense of hashing or uh, ball trees or you know, some sort of data structure that can help there. Uh, and so finally, based on the, the maximum scale, we can control the truncation of the ground distance from there and, and calculate the unbalanced optical transport for some parameter settings. <coughs> So moving on to optimal transport and deep learning. Uh, so two projects here, uh, which is anomaly discriminator and trajectory net. Um, so here you're looking at this network, uh, which we call it which is anomaly detector. Um, so here's some input data that we describe as normal, and uh, this is scoring function based on how normal things are. Uh, red is is very normal, and blue is very not. And so you can see here, if you do this with an autoencoder, you sort of these streaky patterns. Uh, where uh, things that are very far away from the data are considered normal. Uh, but where you do our thing, uh, you don't get this pattern. And so we'll see how and why that's uh, that's common. So <clears throat> given samples from this uh, this anomaly distribution, we want to produce a scoring function. Uh, and that scoring function should be high in anomalous and low in anomalous, or vice versa, because it's not too much. And so this can also be called outlier detection or novel detection, we're looking for things that are different from our data in some way. Um, and so deep anomaly detection 
uh, on image classification is a, is a standard problem now. Um, so we have a bunch of classes of images. We want to decide which one to So we give it only features of airplanes. And then <coughs> we try and see if we can discriminate the airplanes from all of the other classes in the image case. Um, and so the way you do this with uh, reconstruction uh, model is you build an autoencoder or some of these other things, which we lost is uh, the difference between the input and the output once you run it through this constraint model. And then you score it based on how well it reconstructs. So the idea here, right, is if you've only seen airplanes, you can reconstruct airplanes well, but uh, nothing else. And so then you should be able to reconstruct uh, cars poorly or drawings poorly. That's the idea. So here, we're sort of implicitly defining, uh, I guess, inputs, uh, anomalies as inputs that are difficult to reconstruct. And this, this presents some problems. So far back some desirable properties from this anomaly scoring function. We would like to have that maybe similar inputs have similar scores. Uh, we'd like to add maybe, maybe a small number of anomaly samples from training data and have it still work. Uh, and we'd have, like to have very distant points from training data classified as anomalies. And so this is getting back to this picture. Uh, you want things similar, it could be similarly scored, uh, very distant. This, anomalous. this doesn't really happen out of order uh, because you need to carefully constrain them. So uh, there may be some of these naturally. So here, we just have an optimal transport view of the constraint. So the optimal one lipschitz scoring function uh, is this, this character over two inside the Christmas function between the nominal and the other anomalous distribution. So if we had both the nominal and the anomalous distribution, we could immediately uh, find this, this witness function um, and use that as our scoring function. This would be the best among the class of one of six uh, functions between those two distributions. Uh, however, we don't have access right to this anomalous distribution, so we have to do something else. So what we do is take the training data and take the corruptions of the training data. <coughs> um, so in this example, this is Gaussian noise, this is corruption, uh, and then we compare the two. So uh, we, we try and compute the Washington distance and the uh, scoring function between the prep, the distribution, and the train distribution uh, using a Lipschitz neural network function. Uh, so the idea here, right, is that uh, this will be sloped away from the training points. And, uh, so here, right, we get this discriminator that has the training points and then uh, slopes slowly away in all directions. Uh, based on this scoring function. Um, and so the trick here right, is that we want this app to be Lipschitz. So we'd like to optimize over all Lipschitz functions, but uh, we can't do that. Uh, that's very difficult. Um, and so, uh, so there's many different ways to train a Lipschitz neural network. Uh, three ways have been proposed in literature, uh, mostly for Washington GAN, which is a specific type of GAN architecture. Uh, so first was training clipping where you clip the weights and this sort of maybe constrains things. Uh, and we use uh, the, the gradient norm penalty here, which is um, you penalize the gradient to be approximately one everywhere uh, with some penalty. We use the same parameters that we did. Um, and so this has, right, uh, Lipschitz, the offering Lipschitz network has gradient one everywhere. So this is, this is okay. Uh, you could do it other ways, right? You could impose a maximum of one, but uh, this seems to be fine. And finally, you could use spectral normalization. Um, that has different different benefits, but uh, we chose to use gradient bar because it seemed to work here. Um, so, looking at the robustness of the couple score to train set corruption, so um, we like adding these anomalous points not to affect the scoring function very much. And so our illustration here is if you have sort of an anomalous set over here and an anomalous over here, the optimal scoring function is this, is this slope of slash uh, of slope line. Uh, but if you add some anomalous points to the to the training data, then you get the distribution like this. However, if you look at the optimal f for these two distributions, it's still the straight line. Uh, so this is sort of the intuition, right? We, we, want, a, we want a scoring function that doesn't change too much when I add Anomalous points to the, to the uh, training data, uh, and so we can we can prove those properties here uh, that that we can bound it based on the Washington distance if we train the optimal scoring function. Uh, 
which is not necessarily true in a, in a neural network, but and again, uh, we don't necessarily believe the ground distance is perfect from um, neural networks either, so uh, it's some reason. So uh, second property, we wanted to say that outside a, a certain radius, all, all points are scored in that one. Um, and so here we can prove that there's this, uh, there's a constant such that the, uh, for the optimal witness function, um, uh, with on its court, then you have this, uh, this property that outside a certain radius, your your witness function is always below some uh, any value in the chain here. <coughs> um, so this makes sense, right? Because we have some sort of radius for the for number of data, and then the optimal f because we use uh, Gaussian noise or some other sort of corruption that, that has larger support, uh, then you get. Always support outside, right? And guessing is nice because it has support everywhere. So you'll get this optimal f that keeps slipping down for every, uh, in every in every direction away from the um, So just revisiting these properties, uh, similar inputs have similar scores. Uh, you can enforce that by enforcing the gradient penalty. Uh, so right, if your two inputs are similar, then they must have similar outputs uh, with uh, with a small gradient function uh, function of yeah. And so. Uh, we also want it to be robust for a small number of novel samples. Uh, and this is enforced by the first proposition. And we also want very distant points to be classified as novelists, so we enforce that with the second. Um, okay, so moving on to empirical stuff. So it's it's unrealistic to assume that for a large train set you only have novel points. Um, and so mean squared error training approximates this this sort of uh, lower novel scores. Um, equally low like uh, scores across all your data. So right, uh, if you have a single point somewhere, then <coughs> you might, you might uh, it needs to reconstruct that well because it means for an error. So uh, if it reconstructed very poorly, then because of the square, then uh, it'll have very high loss. And so even if you have a single point somewhere, then you'll make sure it means for an error reconstruction, but it reconstructs all points around there uh, fairly well. Um, so the setup we have here was that we added some corruption samples to the training data. So we had a very small number of uh, birds or cats to this uh, this training data, and then we we that the same way. And so here, right, we, we would expect it to work well, uh, just because if we had maybe one percent or five percent enough more samples, then it should still be able to uh, detect what the normal is, right? What lines are normal, and these are these are in there, but not very. Common. Um, and so we trained this on MNIST, and we trained a bunch of models, um, and what we found is training corruptions. Uh, so this is the percentage of samples in the training set that are uh, not from the correct class. Uh, but our, our lectures and only it works quite well. Um, it works better, especially with higher training corruptions. So it preserves uh, its accuracy much better than these other methods, which do too quite quickly. Um, um, yeah. And so we also tested this against the, the all black image. So MS right is a bunch of digits so it's black and with white digits. Uh, and so we want to store the black image. Right? This is sort of always an anomalous point. Uh, but a lot of these, right, because an all black image is very easy to reconstruct. So all these reconstructing based methods reconstruct the black image of course quite well, uh, even though we would consider this not or a not hyperbole. Uh, and so ours always scores this very high as anomalous, uh, whereas others, for instance, uh, score this very low. So like uh, convolutional autoencoder uh, scores this almost hot, like, uh, so this is the score relative to all of them in the training set. So this is, this is higher than you know, uh, like 94% of the, of the digits in the training set. Uh, or sorry. Yeah. So if you take a bunch of ones and you score all the test set ones, then all the test set ones are more anomalous this autoencoder and then uh, this all black image. Um, so we can apply this to healthcare data, right? So um, often you want to figure out what might be an anomalous uh, sample in an EHR, uh, maybe some misspecification or you know, some patient doing very well or very poorly. Um, so here we're looking at creatine levels over a bunch of different lab values. 
and we're looking the same thing. So we're taking creatine as anomalous and then giving it uh, a sample from the non anomalous <coughs> and then a small amount of the creatine. So uh, here with an autoencoder, uh, you've been giving a very, very small amount, so like .05, right, or even less, uh, you get a massive drop in performance. Um, whereas our uh, because of the Lipschitz properties, we have uh, very well performing overall the amounts of correction. So for CFAR10, uh, finally we found the, the performance was very dependent on class. Um, some of them ours did very well, some of them not so much. Um, and we can actually see which one uh, that was. So these are the top nominal images that we trained in uh, the test set. And uh, based on our model and a uh, de Noors and Conversion model encoder trained on other regions. <clears throat> and so basically, the problem for ours is that if cars have a white background, uh, then they are very nominal. Um, but the autoencoder learns to sort of encode everything that is gray quite well. So uh, basically, things that are very far away from this mean image. Um, are hard for an autoencoder to reconstruct. Uh, but the Lipschitz properties would be better at modeling these, these things that are far away from each other. Um, so standard autoencoder, which I we, we implicitly find anomalies is very hard to reconstruct, but we can fix this by looking at optimal transport theory and looking for optimal um, operable witness functions. Okay. <coughs> so finally, uh, so trajectory net is the last project I'll present today. Um, so we're modeling how cells move through genes. The motivation for this is that we have <coughs> longitudinally cross-sectional data. So uh, cross-sectional data is data given in samples from the population, the small number of discrete times. So these are representative samples of the population each time, but we don't know the correspondence between individual points between, uh, between time. So an example of this might be like polling data, survey data. You can't poll the same individuals at each time, but we receive a sample from the population. So this is the same case in single cells. Uh, so where current technologies, they require destroying the cells before, before you measure them. Uh, so you can't measure the same cell at more than one time. Point. But we are able to sample the population at discrete time points, uh, but not the same cells each time. And so we need to process the data at a distribution level. So one of the tasks might be Give a point at time zero, where would it be in time two? Uh, and another point uh, thing would be uh, predict what the distribution would look like at, at, at time 1.5. Um, so we're going to solve this with uh, trajectory net and apply this to this point here. So previous work used optimal transport in that it, it found the coupling between each pair that minimized the optimal transport distance. Um, and so then you can interpolate right, where, where a point would be based on where it would be on this map. So this is sort of a, a linear thing, um, and we wanted to do it yeah, using the neural network and with not linear path. Uh, this is called wadding out to, as I mentioned very early, um, to decide the cost between cells as a Euclidean distance. Um, and you can infer predictions based on this uh, based on this kind of um, And so what we used instead was a, a normalizing flow. Uh, that specifically continuous normalizing flow, but we'll talk about normalizing flows first. Um, so normalizing flows transform a simple distribution like a Gaussian into a more useful one from invertible normal network for a series of invertible transformations. Um, so invertibility means that you can change the, uh, and the change of variables means that you look at the, uh, this log probability over time. And so you can maximize this function, this log probability of type one, and get a neural network that is both convertible uh, and fully uh, follows through data. And so what turns to be more efficient is if you can uh, do multiple layers of this. So you can look at a series of transformations. <coughs> uh, as each layer is invertible, all of the, the whole thing together is invertible. And you can use the change of variables function again iteratively to find the log probability of time zero the first time one. Uh, so this makes loss makes it very easy. You can just maximize the log probability. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and so in continuous normalizing flows, instead of <coughs> doing a bunch of discrete transformations, 
we're looking at uh, an integration of this. Uh, we'll make this continuous. So now we have a function f that breaks the derivative, and then we can create the function over time uh, to get the continuous form. And we can use the uh, continuous analog with the change of variables uh, to do this. And so uh, this, is, this is interesting because uh, this is. This is actually slower because you need to uh, look at a Jacobian time step. Uh, this only needs the choice because of the continuous nature. So what this looks like, right, is that you have this derivative function f that's defined at each time. And so that's basically an error. And then you can look at where the mass goes uh, over time. So if you wanted to turn, for instance, like Gaussian blob into a nickel loop, uh, this would look like uh, Right, moving the probability mass based on this vector field. So this vector field is going to be over, and now we can look at the density over time that it creates by integrating. Um, and so these continuous form flows, they, they can be used to transport the populations uh, of cells or anything else, um, but they may produce implausible or circuitous paths, right? And so we would like to constrain this. Um, so next we're looking at how to extend straight paths to the randomization. So the idea here is to kind of like the path density, so we square it out to more of the derivatives. Um, so if the path is straight, then this, this part of the derivative is, is, uh, yeah, doesn't change, so we're uh, going to fix, so it's the minimum squared there. Um, so this is looking for straight paths. So this delayed stuff in transport, so Right. So if we look at the dynamic couple transport problem, um, so this is a different formula for the Russian conditions based on uh, moving a point over time. So if you look at the, the flow, uh, then <coughs> you can either look at, uh, this is looking at like a fixed space or a fixed, uh, looking at the perspective of a point. Um, so if you preserve mass, and you know, you're that you know, you know, you get the distribution of one or the other, uh, this is what dynamic couple transport. Uh, so now we'd like to connect the continuous underlying flows to this dynamic optimal transport. So we can take a regularized determinist uh, normalizing flow and instead of uh, constraining this to be exactly equal to the end distribution, we just add a, a divergence penalty between the output of the distribution and the, um, the correct distribution, then uh, we get approximately the optimal So the idea here, right, is that we want to penalize the total distance, and if we do that, then we can get a continuous normalizing flow of that parts of the um, So what does this look like? We have a gas distribution here, and we'd like to transform it into this thing. Um, so we'd like one that takes reasonable paths. So if you just apply continuous normalizing flow to this uh, target, then you get these, these sort of paths, right? They're not, they're not straight. Right? So the curve along the X is the fall on density, which is kind of interesting. Uh, that's in contrast to this dynamic couple transport where lines are straight or continuously like flow with what we're calling the energy regulation, which regulates the path energy. Um, so this is useful because now we know where the flows are going and we can change to the minimal distance if we would like. Um, so just to recap, right, we have the space trajectory net that models uh, continuous the flow with an energy penalty. Uh, so this is very useful for other applications where you can do better transport, uh, but we can do more and better for modern cells.